Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Michael Liu, Chief Financial Officer with Bubon Shopping Center and Executive Committee Member of the Portland Business Alliance Board of Directors. Thanks for joining us today for the Oregon Business Plan's Federal Legislative Briefing and Discussion with Representative Suzanne Bonamici. For years, the Alliance has partnered with Oregon Business and Industry and the Oregon Business Council to take our federal agenda to Oregon's congressional representatives in Washington, D.C. Due to COVID-19, going in person this year was not an option. However, we are very grateful to be able to connect with Representative Bonamici via Zoom today. We will hear Representative Bonamici's perspective on the federal response to the COVID-19 pandemic and recession. Thoughts on the American Rescue Plan, President Biden's uh, infrastructure plan for leadership to expand access to childcare and so much more. A recording of this presentation and links for resources mentioned will be available on our website later today. If you have a question, we ask that you share your question with us using the Q&A tool at the bottom of your Zoom window. The, on the only questions we will be reviewing will be through this tool. If you have a comment, you can share it with everyone by using the comment function. Now I would like to introduce the Congresswoman. Welcome Congresswoman Bonamici. Thank you so much, Michael. Thank you for inviting me to this virtual event. Uh, thank you for facilitating, Michael. I really look forward to meeting in person again, hopefully soon. Um, and what I'll do is I'll start with an update on the American Rescue Plan, but really look forward to taking your questions. I know there's, there's a lot to discuss. Uh, the American Rescue Plan aims to do exactly what its name states, which is rescue our country. Uh, from the deadly pandemic that's taken more than 550,000 lives, left millions unemployed and devastated our economy. This relief package is scaled to meet the tremendous needs in our communities. Uh, the crisis has swamped states and cities with steep new costs and declining revenues, making it vital that Congress and President Biden step in, and we did. The American Rescue Plan is now law. Funds are going out to help the people of Northwest Oregon and across the country, uh, many of whom have reached out to me during this past year. Now, you're likely familiar with the portions of the American Rescue Plan that benefit employers. Uh, this uh, law will provide about $50 billion for employers, including uh, $7 billion for forgivable loans through the Paycheck Protection Program, 15 billion in idle, the economic injury disaster loans through a grant program targeted at the hardest hit small businesses, about $28 billion to create the restaurant revitalization fund grant program. And, and the bill also establishes the community navigator pilot program to help small business owners understand and access relief programs, many of which were you know, started their new programs, many of them. There's 10 billion for the state small business credit initiative. Oregon received about 56 million of that. This program is going to leverage more than 100 billion nationally for small businesses. The law also targets um, relief to those who have been hardest hit by the pandemic. Putting money in people's pockets is provided stimulus checks of up to $1,400 means tested per adult and children for eligible families. The vast majority of Oregonians have qualified and constituents have told me that this has really been a lifeline for families and we know much of this relief is being spent in local communities and local businesses. The American Rescue Plan importantly expands the child tax credit. This is going to provide families with additional tax relief of up to $1,600 per child under the age of six and as much as $1,000 for dependents between six and 17 years old. In Oregon, it's gonna help families of about 779,000 children. And it's going to lift about 40,000 children out of poverty. Nationally, it's estimated that the child tax credit expansion, expansion is going to cut the number of children living in poverty in half. That's pretty significant. It's kind of a once in a generation victory for children and a meaningful investment in our future. I know we'll be looking at making this provision permanent. The American Rescue Plan also provides a lifeline of continued unemployment relief to workers who have lost jobs and otherwise 
would have lost uh, unemployment benefits on March 31st. About 18 million people were unemployed at some point during 2020. It was a really tough year. The American Rescue Plan makes the first $10,200 of unemployment benefits received during 2020 tax-free. So these workers can pay their bills. This is especially helpful for the 4 million people nationwide who are facing long-term unemployment of six months or more. And we know it's harder for them to get back into work. Uh, the American Rescue Plan includes $350 billion in funding for state and local governments. As a former state legislator, I know how important that is. And that's about a little more than two billion, excuse me, four point two billion dollars for Oregon, and this funding really is about jobs and services, the jobs of first responders, frontline public health workers, teachers, transit workers, and other essential workers, so they can continue to provide services that the public relies on. Uh, we know how important those services have been. I also helped lead the effort to secure $130 billion for K-12 schools. Uh, and that's nationally in the American Rescue Plan. And these funds are designed to really help our schools open safely, address learning loss and serve our students who have many of whom have truly struggled over this last year. It includes more than $1.1 billion for Oregon schools like Almonica Elementary in Beaverton, which I visited uh, recently to see how they were preparing for students to return to in-person learning. I have to say it was pretty wonderful to see the enthusiasm of the educators. And I got to meet some students who were remote learning, distance learning, who were so excited about coming back to the, the classroom. And finally, the American Rescue Plan will help keep more people in their homes and apartments with housing assistance and put food on the table with this, uh, nutrition assistance for 40 million people. I'm also excited to, to, uh, to say that this transformational legislation was um, signed into law, but I'm, I'm going to continue to work uh, with Oregonians to find out where we have needs for more resources so that we can recover, but also build back better to, to borrow the term from President Biden in particular as Congress turns on uh, to working on an infrastructure package, and I trust you'll be hearing from uh, my, my other colleagues, including Congressman DeFazio, who's chairing the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee, um, I will be lifting up the needs and priorities of Northwest Oregon, make sure that our investments in infrastructure are also investments in climate resilience and sustainability. So there is a lot to talk about. I'm gonna turn it back, uh, back over to Michael, and I know we have some, uh, some topics to cover. Thank you, Congresswoman. Uh, thanks for those opening remarks and the update on the American Rescue Plan. Um, the first question I'd like to start with is sort of the ongoing va vandalism and violence in Portland, which has plagued our city for many months. Businesses have sustained tens of millions of dollars in damage, including the targeting of dozens of Asian-owned businesses across the entire region. We are pleased to see the U.S. Senate pass the COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act last week which provided direction and resources to the Justice Department and local public safety agencies to more forcefully investigate crimes targeting Asian Americans on a resounding 94 to one vote. How fast do you think this will be taken up in the House and are there other actions Congress and the administration are planning to end the violence and vandalism we are all experiencing? Well, Thank you so much for that question, Michael. I want to start by saying that I condemn violence of any kind as well as property destruction. Uh, I'm also keenly aware of the housing challenges uh, in the Pacific Northwest, particularly in Portland, which I know is going to require federal as well as state and local uh, solutions. Um, and I have been heartbroken, but also infuriated by the recent violent attacks on members of our AAPI community and vandalism against AAPI owned businesses, including here in Oregon. Uh, it's been a lot of propaganda, racist propaganda that's fueled some of these attacks. It's hateful, it's harmful, and it must stop. So I've joined my colleagues and President Biden in condemning this anti-AAPI bias, 
hate speech and hate crimes in the strongest possible terms. I was also excited to see that strong vote in the Senate on the COVID-19 hate crimes bill. I am co-sponsoring my friend and colleague Grace Meng's bill. It's a companion bill in the House. I understand that Speaker Pelosi plans to advance this legislation uh, next month uh, during AAPI Heritage Month. But there are also other opportunities uh, for Congress. There are uh, pieces of legislation that um, I'm supporting to implement improvements to hate crime reporting, uh, to train law enforcement on hate crimes, to provide funding to support states establishing hate crimes hotlines. There's also a bill that will establish a national commission to investigate the rise in hate crimes and provide further recommendations. Um, so we'll, we are keeping an eye on this. Uh, we know how important it is to address these, uh, th these crimes that are happening, this hate that is happening. Um, across the country, particularly targeting our AAPI um, businesses. Thank you for that answer. Um, a a follow-up question kind of dealing with uh, some of the stuff you mentioned um, in regards to downtown Portland. Um, right. Right. Downtown has been hugely impacted by, um, you know, loss of workforce during the pandemic. Do you see an opportunity for the business community to partner with you to secure targeted federal aid for downtown Portland, which is the beating heart of Oregon's economy? Yes, and thank you so much for, for that question as well. Um, I worked when I was a, a lawyer, I worked in downtown Portland. It is, Portland is, is full of so much potential. It's a, it's a wonderful city. Uh, we have to overcome these challenges and I'm happy to partner with you uh, to support any specific proposals to help downtown and the many businesses that make it an engine uh, of economic growth in our region, absolutely. Um, the American Rescue Plan actually allocated $157 million from, for Multnomah County and another $218 million for the city of Portland. So there are uh, resources in the American Rescue Plan. I encourage you to discuss with city and county leaders as well. I know part of the reason downtown has been struggling is you know, during the pandemic, many people who used to work downtown would shop downtown and eat in restaurants downtown. And now they've been working from home and uh, it really hasn't, uh, uh, downtown hasn't had the business that it, that it needs. So funds from the bill are eligible to help. Uh, in the short term and in the long term, we, we need to, to work together to, to rebuild the, the economy in Portland and across Oregon. Um, speaking of the short term, uh, Governor Brown just announced today that 14 counties are moving back to the extreme yeah. risk category, which is going to make it a little more difficult. But um, what's yes, your approach sir. to economic recovery for Oregon businesses? While the American Rescue Plan will give us a much needed boost, when do you envision a return to our pre-COVID economy? Well, thank you, Michael. And yes, I'm, I'm aware of that. Uh, you know, sometimes it feels like you know, there's light at the end of the tunnel, but the, the tunnel's still long, sadly. Um, and at, at times like this, I wish I had a, a working crystal ball. I know that the timing in large part is gonna depend on, on how and where and when people get vaccinated and the percentage of people who choose to not get vaccinated. Those things matter, uh, and we have worked hard through the American Rescue Plan uh, on vaccination distribution, getting more vaccines out there in the community. And it's an equity issue as well, making sure that there's equitable distribution. But we do know uh, another thing too, is that the pre-COVID economy was not working well for everyone. And it's essential that as we're looking at building back that we provide relief and also improve on inequities that existed. So one of the the goals of the American Rescue Plan was to help the economy recover faster. And I think that leading economists estimate that the American Rescue Plan could help create about seven and a half million jobs in 2021 uh, and help us return to pre-pandemic employment in one year instead of three years. So I, I wanna applaud by, uh, or applaud the business groups for stepping up uh, to help deliver resources and information. I know that you are doing what you can. That's absolutely vital uh, to, to help our communities. And I have had conversations really throughout the pandemic with all kinds of businesses, all sizes and all locations in Northwest Oregon. And they're doing what they can to stay afloat, but uh, many have, have really struggled and, and are at the risk of losing their livelihood. And, and I wanted to, to let people know my, my first job 
uh, which was a long time ago, was in my, my mom had a small business, a retail store. So I, I really know the, the hard work, the dedication, the struggle of running a business and appreciate the, the value of small businesses to our communities and to our economy. So the, the programs that we've invested in for business support from PPP and IDLE, which I'd mentioned to the SBA, I know these programs have saved many uh, businesses but there have been gaps uh, in issues that have prevented uh, some businesses from getting relief. So the American Rescue Plan is providing additional assistance to small businesses to help them keep their doors open and keep employees on payroll. Um, the Shuttered Venue Operators Grant Program struggled for a bit, but now that's open. We know, you know particularly in places like Portland, our museums, theaters, artists, musicians, uh, it has been really tough. Uh, often they were the first places to close and will likely be the last to reopen. The restaurants as well. Um, shout out to my colleague Earl Blumenauer uh, for helping on this, really taking the lead on the restaurant funding uh, that's in the American Rescue Plan. And we just learned this morning that the Small Business Administration is going to have that fund open for applications starting on Monday, uh, this coming Monday. So. Uh, also note, uh, important to keep in mind that the pandemic has highlighted um, a lot of disparities, particularly for historically underserved communities and exposed a lot of systemic barriers, drawn attention to institutional racism. I've heard from small business owners who were, who were unable to access aid or find a lender to work with them. Um, so I'm committed to you know, helping to level the playing field for all of those entrepreneurs and advocated for more accountability and transparency in those small business loan programs and grant programs. And these oversight efforts are going to make help us make sure that the assistance is really getting to those who need it most, our business owners, small business owners, people of color, women. So I recently joined my colleagues in urging the new uh, small business administration administrator Guzman to provide updates on how she's going to be collecting demographic data, making sure that underserved entrepreneurs are not unfairly excluded. So finally, we've seen kind of unequal effects of the pandemic on women in particular. Um, so the recovery is going to have to address some of these disparities and it's why uh, childcare is one of my top priorities. If we don't fix a childcare system, we won't have an economic recovery. And we have seen that. You know, childcare was already a challenge before the pandemic. And the pandemic has, again, exacerbated this challenge. And a lot of women have left the workforce because they don't have childcare. And then one more, I said finally, but one more point, uh, climate action uh, is also going to be part of our recovery. Last year's wildfires, this year's uh, uh, past ice storm, uh, are part of the climate crisis. The climate crisis really has uh, um, uh, increased the frequency and intensity of some of these severe weather events. It's been devastating to our hospitality and outdoor recreation industries in particular. Um, diners don't wanna sit outside in the smoke uh, or an ice storm. So Oregon has the potential to be at the forefront of the clean energy economy. So tremendous amount of potential there. Sounds good, thanks for those answers. Um, Next question is going to be um, OBI and the PBA signed on to the U.S. Chamber campaign to advocate for the passage of a federal infrastructure package by the 4th of July. There seemed to be a growing bipartisan support for the federal infrastructure package, but that seems to be less likely now. Um, what chances do you see for getting an infrastructure package done by July and what will be the important steps to getting that done? Well, I am optimistic. Cautiously optimistic, but very optimistic that we can pass an infrastructure bill this summer. Um, and we are fortunate that Oregon's own Chairman Peter DeFazio is the, the House lead on this. And I'm certainly going to do everything I can to get it across the finish line. We know that the need for infrastructure investments in our communities is immense. So the House passed in the last Congress the Comprehensive Moving Forward Act. It's stalled in the Senate. Um, this is our, our template that we're working with. I have long uh, said that a comprehensive infrastructure package needs to go beyond roads and bridges. There's a lot of conversations now about what does infrastructure mean. It also uh, needs to include in investing in ports and accessible public transit, uh, affordable housing, upgrading water systems, extending broadband, another area where the pandemic has 
highlighted inequities, grid modernization. You know, all of these are important to our economy. And if we want to continue to be the leader that we are, uh, then we need to make these investments. And also another important point to consider is that uh, this federal spending on infrastructure is going to include opportunities for workers and economic development. So I'm working to make sure that the economic benefit of infrastructure investments is really extending to workers who have traditionally not been part of the construction sector, for example. That includes expanding access to job training and support services to women, people of color, making long-term investments in transportation and infrastructure. It's gonna stimulate the economy and create jobs and drive commerce. So it's also, as I mentioned earlier, an opportunity to rebuild in a sustainable and resilient manner to reduce carbon emissions, which we know we need to do, to improve energy efficiency and to protect our communities from toxins. So uh, I am the uh, only member of Congress from the Pacific Northwest serving on the Select Committee on the Climate Crisis. I had the opportunity to help author a bold, comprehensive science-driven climate action plan to reach net zero emissions no later than mid-century and net negative thereafter. Uh, there's an entire section of the report on how we need to decarbonize your transportation system and strengthen investments in resilient infrastructure. So these conversations uh, of addressing the climate crisis and infrastructure are really going hand in hand. I do want to note there is a cost to inaction, which is another reason why I'm optimistic. The administration understands this. The transportation secretary understands this. Um, there are our new, um, ex I'm very excited that Dr. Jane Lubchenco from Oregon State, for a former NOAA administrator is coming back to the Office of Science and Technology Policy. Uh, Dr. Lubchenco understands it. Unfortunately, um, much of our nation's infrastructure is aging and deteriorating as well. According to the fourth national climate assessment, which is done by government agencies, by 2025, if we fail to address the aging and deteriorating infrastructure, it's expected to cost as much as $3.9 trillion. I often hear from communities in Northwest Oregon about the significant, significant infrastructure needs they are facing. And I understand especially smaller communities will not meet their needs without significant investment from the federal government. Speaking of uh, funding, that kind of brings us to the topic with uh, taxes. Um, Right. The infrastructure package, um, we're kind of concerned with how to pay for it and whether the repeal of the cap on the state and local tax deduction might be in play. Um, a bipartisan group of legislatures have formed with um, high, other high-impact high states. Um, we know Multnomah County presently is one of, if not the highest state and local tax burden um, area um, in the nation. Um, are you in favor of lifting the cap? Well, first I wanna say that I opposed the bill in which Congress capped the SALT deduction uh, in part because the this is the big ta Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. It, it did not accomplish the goals it purported to accomplish. And I would like to see the cap repealed, but I also expect that there will be additional opportunities to address, address other uh, problems with the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, especially as we're discussing possible sources for revenue for the infrastructure package. I will consider them all and seek to move forward with what's uh, most viable and effective. Uh, because again, the, I can't emphasize enough the importance of making these investments now uh, so that we, we are uh, not adding additional costs later. It doesn't get any less expensive going forward if we fail to maintain uh, and protect uh, and, and build this infrastructure that we need. Perfect. Um, one of the projects that's um, kind of important for us here is the um, I-5 bridge. Uh, Oregon and Washington are on a collaborative track to replace the I-5 inter interstate bridge. An experienced team has been brought to manage the process. This includes three bi-state equity-based advisory committees established to guide the decision-making process through transparent dialogue on a locally preferred alternative to replace this obsolete piece of critical regional infrastructure. Do you support this renewed I-5 bridge replacement program? And what can we do to make sure this critical project gets completed? 
Uh, yes, you, you said it. It's obsolete. Uh, yes, I support the bridge bridge project. Um, the I-5 bridge really is a choke point for the region and it needs to be a high priority. It's also a safety issue. Um, as we know, we are overdue for an earthquake and in the Cascadia subduction zone. And so we need to build uh, the, the bridge to withstand an earthquake, but it's also an opportunity to reduce emissions. I've said for years, uh, this bridge needs to include transit. I'm glad to see state leaders are exploring options. We need to make sure we have ample opportunity for community input uh, and a real clear, consistent understanding between the states. And I'm ready to support the process however I can. Perfect. I'm going to bring you back to something you were talking about with uh, rural areas. Um, we know that for too many Oregonians, especially in rural and high poverty areas of the state, high speed internet is not accessible. President Biden has included $100 billion for broadband expansion in its infrastructure package. The plan advances connectivity as a new, as a new right, similar to how electricity became an essential service during the last major American push for infrastructure. Can you provide your thoughts on whether the plan as written delivers the lowest cost high speed internet to those who lack it? Well, first I wanna affirm how important broadband is in this age. This is another area where the pandemic has you know, exposed and exacerbated uh, and that uh, inequities. And that is true with education, with people trying to work from home, with telehealth. There's been so many examples where there are uh, tremendous equity issues by lack of access. Uh, it's a necessity now. Um, it is uh, it is something we we absolutely must make sure people have. And there's been unfortunately this widening gap between those with access and those who are shut out. Um, it, and and you're right that it isn't just an urban uh, or excuse me a rural issue. There there are urban areas that are also affected. I hear about workers and their children parking outside of libraries or places where they can get internet in their cars. So it's even more important uh, than, than ever. So I've heard about, for example, the city of Hillsborough has a plan to create a municipal broadband network. This is a model we can look at in other places. And I know that President Biden's infrastructure proposal could help that model expand in more places. So I'm certainly open to input on broadband provisions and how we can best meet the significant needs in our communities. Thanks. I'm going to change subjects a little bit. Um, you've been a leader in expanding access to child care, including your own extremely thorough report entitled Child Care in Crisis. What are some of the policy solutions you propose in that report that you're most excited about? And what are the prospects for moving these through Congress? Well, thank you. And uh, yes, we put together a child care and crisis report. We started working on actually before the pandemic and now the needs are even greater. Um, if families get are, are ready to get back to work and they don't have access to childcare, the economic crisis is not going to end. And that's particularly true for mothers. I've seen moms already forced out of work, as I mentioned in staggering numbers. According to the National Women's Law Center, women are at the lowest level of participation in the workforce since 1988. So we really need to provide the resources to meet this challenge. And that means stabilizing and vastly improving the childcare system. And I've been leading that effort, uh, dedicating more federal resources really essential. Um, and you know, we have, uh, we have to, right now we're seeing people trying to cover the cost of childcare, but also meet the needs of childcare providers and early childhood educators who are often paid poverty wages and can't even afford childcare for their own children. So we really need a game-changing investment in this area because it's it, when something is too expensive for the people who need the service, but the people who are providing the services are already not making enough money, it requires investment. So I called on President Biden to include childcare support. In the next relief package, there was some $40 billion in the American Rescue Plan that's a historic investment. Uh, I recently joined with Senator Warren in advancing for a groundbreaking uh, investment in Americans, American Families Plan. Um, and so uh, the, uh, President Biden is soon gonna be announcing his social infrastructure plan. So we'll be looking at that. I have the Child Care as Infrastructure Act, which can serve as a model for proposals going forward. This is also 
um, addressing the needs in the child care system is also an issue of racial and economic justice. The child care workforce is overwhelmingly women and predominantly women of color. So we have to make sure that child care providers and these early childhood educators are paid a living wage that reflects the true value of their, of their skilled work. So I support the Child Care for Working Families Act, and that's going to, to help with the living wage. And then along with other barriers, um, families of color face this wage gap, unpredictable scheduling, lack of access to paid leave, and that makes quality, affordable child care even less accessible. So we know that we need to distribute resources in an equitable way, but I also want to share um, a, a, a quote um, when people say, why do we need, why does the federal government need to invest in childcare? And particularly as we're looking at our, the, the underinvestment with black indigenous fa and fa families and workers of color. So Professor James Heckman, who's a Nobel prize winner in economics said this, short-term costs are more than offset by the immediate and long-term benefits through reduction in the need for special education and remediation, better health outcomes, reduced need for social services, lower criminal justice costs, and increased self-sufficiency and productivity among families. That's what happens when we invest in childcare and early childhood education. Thank you. Um, another area you prioritize is workforce development. We know that despite the economic downturn, many of Oregon's critical industries, including manufacturing, could be facing shortages and trained workers as the retirement of the baby boomer generation accelerates. We also know that the COVID-19 pandemic has disproportionately impacted communities of color, immigrants, and other historically underserved communities. Please tell us the efforts you are leading in taking on this challenge and how we direct workforce and job training resources to make sure that they get to communities who have been impacted the most by the global pandemic. Well, thank you for this question. I'm, I'm also very excited that tomorrow we have um, President uh, Mark Mitsui from Portland Community College in our Education and Labor Committee hearing about this topic. Uh, the pandemic, as we know, has been devastating for workers. Nationally, about 10 million are currently unemployed. More than 4 million, as I mentioned, are facing long-term unemployment. Reports suggest that as many as 7 million jobs may not return after the pandemic. So I'm thrilled uh, that President Biden responded to my call for a robust investment in our nation's workforce. And that's in the Americans' jobs plan. I work to include the $100 billion to upskill and reskill workers. Uh, on the Education and Labor Committee, I have seen firsthand and heard from workers about, for example, registered apprenticeships, which are life-changing. We just updated uh, the National Apprenticeship Act for the first time since the 1930s. Uh, apprenticeships are a great way, especially for people who have historically left, left been left out of the trades. One worker told me he thinks about how lucky he is every day when he laces up his boots to go to work. Another one told me about the example she's setting for her daughter and that she's able to support her family because she got the skills she needs to get a good job through a registered apprenticeship. So we did the, the um, National Apprenticeship Act in the House. It's bipartisan legislation to create nearly a million new registered apprenticeships, youth apprenticeships and pre-apprenticeships and that's over the next five years. That includes my Bipartisan Partners Act, uh, which supports industry partnerships that bring together employers, education, training, labor, and community-based organizations to create pay-down-the-job training programs that meet the needs of employers and provide workers with the support services. For example, tools, safety gear, transportation, childcare, they can get them through the training program and be successful. So in the coming months, we're gonna be working to pass the American Jobs Plan to build back better. We spoke about investments in our aging infrastructure and how they're critical, but also investments in our people, the people who are gonna be doing the repairing and rebuilding, they're important as well. So I'm working to advance my Bipartisan Builds Act, which I recently reintroduced to support workers, particularly those who have been historically uh, facing barriers to employment to help them access uh, jobs in clean energy and infrastructure. So this transition to the clean energy economy 
is going to create a demand for more workers. There's already an unmet need for skilled workers in the energy efficient sector. So the climate action plan that I worked on with a select committee on the climate crisis, there's an entire pillar focused on clean energy jobs, uh, including workforce funding. So there's a tremendous amount of potential. We need to have that path there for people to get into these good paying jobs that will will be there in the infrastructure and energy sectors. Okay. Uh, next, I'm gonna talk a little bit about trade. Um, as you know, Oregon is one of the most trade dependent states in the nation and relies heavily on the ability to export our manufacturing products. You've been a strong advocate for free trade policies and we remain grateful for your help in passing the USMCA. Oregon's business community is certainly happy to see a less isolationist administration in the White House. What's on the horizon as far as international trade? Thank you for that question. I was truly honored uh, when Speaker Pelosi asked me to serve on the very small group of um, Democrats to negotiate uh, with the Trump administration for the new USMCA. Um, and we did that successfully. It was a lot of work, but it was worth it. Um, and I'm also very excited to work with our new US Trade Representative, Catherine Tai, who I worked closely with in that work uh, on the USMCA. I'm really grateful that President Biden was receptive to my call. Uh, I was joined by Judy Chu, who chairs the AAPI caucus uh, to nominate her for, for USTR. I, I wanna note that she had a, a rare um, unanimous confirmation in her Senate process, and she really is I'm going to be a skilled leader. Um, she really does know uh, the, uh, the the not only the law but the 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 policies and politics of it all. Um, she's going to focus on the environment, workers, our country, American manufacturing. And so I recently was, have been leading an effort to advance and improve international environmental protections. And that begins with Mexico and Canada as part of the USMCA. I've called on Ambassador Tai and the Biden administration to incorporate the Paris Climate Accord into the USMCA as a binding trade commitment. We're also pressing for the full implementation of several environmental provisions of that agreement. And over the past a few years, I've worked with the USTR. I've worked with several United States trade representatives in my time in Congress, but also um, uh, the harmful tariffs, um, including, for example, in the hazelnut industry and other industries here in Oregon, I know how challenging that's been. So overall, I'm looking forward to more stability and certainty in our trade relationships and an administration we can work with to further the economic goals of the Pacific Northwest. Thank you. Um, Another question has to do with uh, natural disasters. Um, Oregon businesses were seriously impacted by last year's historic wildfire season, with many still struggling to recover and looking ahead to this summer with extreme apprehension. In your view, what's the best way to try and prevent and recover from these natural disasters? Thank you. It, it was devastating. Um, last year, the, the fires in Oregon destroyed communities, took lives, threatened health. I'm really grateful very grateful to the first responders, <clears throat> excuse me, and volunteers who saved lives and really made a difference. And I know it's a long road to recovery and it's not a surprise that people and businesses are feeling stressed about the this, this season coming up. Uh, we need to make sure that Oregonians get the resources they need to rebuild and help for those who are displaced. When we worked with FEMA, I attended on-the-site briefings both in Yamhill and Clackamas counties and continue to work with farmers and wineries that, that were hurt uh, by the smoke and the fire. Uh, here's a, a situation where this was exacerbated by the climate crisis. So again, it's critical that we take action. I mentioned the climate action plan and my role on the select committee. Uh, and we're working to advance that climate action plan and bring resources to, to Oregonians. But uh, clim the climate crisis is exacerbating these uh, you know, more severe weather events, more extreme heats, uh, more potential for drought, uh, and that makes the, the wildfires even worse. So we, we have to do you know, short-term help the people and businesses, but long-term we, we absolutely need to take action and stem the climate crisis. Uh, we've covered a lot of topics uh, in this uh, time period. I'm going to change it up again. Um, uh, you've been an advocate for Oregon's rapidly growing cannabis industry. And thanks to your efforts and those of your colleagues, such as Representative uh, Blumenauer, 
the House just passed on a bipartisan vote, the Safe Banking Act, which will allow banks and other financial institutions to work with cannabis businesses. This is a critical legislation to Oregon's cannabis industry as we continue to see the detrimental impacts of federal laws that force businesses to operate only in cash. What chance do you give for this legislation to pass the Senate this year? And what are some of the other efforts you and your colleagues are engaged in to support the cannabis industry? Thank you. And um, the, I'm, again, an optimist by nature. Uh, we had a bipartisan uh, bill uh, pass in the House, and it really is about public safety and accountability, but also respecting states' rights. Uh, bipartisanship is going to help its chances in the Senate. It's, it's not an easy road, but we're, we'll keep working on it. One key fact is that 47 states have voted to legalize cannabis in some form. It's an enormous industry, close to $18 billion industry. And regardless of where people were on the ballot measure, uh, the people have spoken. Uh, and this conflict between state and federal laws has meant that, as you mentioned, Michael, legal legitimate businesses are forced to operate on a cash only basis. And that creates a really serious public safety risk but it also provides an opportunity for tax evasion and other crimes. So I will continue to look for opportunities to address this issue and work with the administration. Um, I also note that I've been a supporter of industrial hemp since I was in the Oregon legislature with another, it's an uh, agricultural crop with a, a great economic potential, but we've got to make sure that these businesses that are operating legally under state law can bank safely. Um, so you have representatives from Oregon's three largest business organizations here in the meeting today. Um, this is a two-part question. What's your message to Oregon employers? And what can Oregon employers do to help with it? Well, I think my message to Oregon employers is thank you. Thank you for your perseverance. It's been a unprecedented unprecedented year. Uh, the economic downturn through a global pandemic has been really challenging, but you know, we do have the Oregon spirit of creativity and resourcefulness that's helped us get through these really difficult times. Um, I always, the way you can help me is that I always wanna hear from you uh, about your successes and challenges and places where we can work together. If you have accessed federal funds, what worked? If you, if you could not access federal funds, uh, I'd like to hear from you about that as well. I'd really like to hear about skills gaps as I advocate for workforce programs. If you have positions that are you're struggling to fill, and that's something I hear about quite a lot, uh, please uh, let me know about that as well as I advocate for workforce programs. Your experiences and expertise will help inform my work in Washington, DC. And just one quick story about that. Recently, I was talking to a restaurant owner who said, you know, once I get my restaurant back open, I, you know, I have positions open and I'm really having a, a tough time filling them. At the same time, we have a Job Corps program that's run through the Department of Labor over at Tongue Point in Astoria where they're talking about cutting their culinary arts program. So we need to work together and say to the Job Corps program, uh, if you're cutting it because demand is down, the demand is down because of the pandemic, don't cut a program that's going to give people the skills they need to work in the restaurant industry when there are needs out there for people with those skills. So uh, that's a place where we can work together. So please keep in touch with your needs and what you're seeing out there in the communities. And thanks for your perseverance during a really, really tough year. Thanks. Uh, those were the last of the, the questions that we had, but it looks like we have a little time left for um, questions from the audience. Um, let's see here. Um, we have a question from Keith Wilson, CEO of a great, P a great PBA member company, Titan Freight Systems. His question is about the 20 billion President Biden proposed for high-speed rail. Do you support this proposal? And do you see future investments when you consider that, for example, it will cost by some estimates $40 billion for high-speed rail from Eugene to Vancouver, BC? Well, we, we are behind other countries um, in, in, in offering options like high-speed rail. Um, so I would want to take a look at where that specific proposal is and how it's funded and where it would, would the high-speed rail would be. But I do know that uh, you know other countries are ahead of us in offering high-speed rail. And you know as we as we 
transition to a clean energy economy, we want the ability to get uh, more people, more transit options. So I certainly am open to it uh, and look forward to hearing from the community about it as well. Thank you. Um, I think that's it. You're getting off easy with uh, questions Only from the audience. Only one question, that's great. Well, I really appreciate the opportunity to, to speak with you all. Thank you to PBA and all the business organizations that are here today. Uh, thanks for all you do in the community and uh, stay safe. Uh, I know we're, uh, there's, a, again, like I said, light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, we all have to work together to get there. So thank you again. Thank you for your time today. Um, thank you, Mike. I also, um, I also wanted to thank our partners at Oregon Business Plan for helping make today's event possible. Um, join us for our next federal legislative briefing with Representative Blumenauer on May 5th. Um, to register, visit portlandalliance.com. Again, a recording of this presentation and links for resources mentioned will be available on our website later today. Um, again, thank you for your time. Representative Suzanne Bonamici, and it was a pleasure talking to you today. Thank you, likewise.